Hi, I'm Dr Laura Mitchell and this presentation on games and play, practice and pedagogy is a recording of a presentation that I gave at the University of York in June 2022. The presentation will cover a range of play theories and go on to talk about gamification and the application of games to learning. This discussion of the application of games to learning will provide you with some concepts to understand more effectively how game design is tied up with learning content. However, it is not a how-to. The application of games to learning can be very hit and miss. And I can speak to this from personal experience. I have a horrific memory of a board game my parents once encouraged me to play as a small child about safely crossing the road. It was not particularly fun. In fact, it was not enjoyable at all from my point of view. These kind of endeavours are further complicated by the common association between games and digital technologies. While a large number of analogue games have been employed for learning, generally contemporary discussion of learning and gamification concentrates on the use of computer games, smartphone applications and play platforms that are appropriated or made available through commercial organisations. I will touch on some of these examples later, but the main focus of this talk will be on play and theories of play and how this can be uh, integrated with our understanding of how we plan learning in the classroom. Play and learning in higher education. I have chosen to focus on play in this session because the appropriation and application of games in higher education is a much more complex endeavour and relies more on collaboration between instructors and game designers. There are a lot of incredibly innovative projects going on out there, including the use of digital games, analogue games and escape rooms, as well as gamification techniques such as badging, which I'll mention later in the presentation. So why is it that play is becoming popular in higher education? Fundamentally, classical approaches to learning that many of us are very familiar with tend towards a cognitive content bias. After all, students have come to university in order to gain knowledge at an extensive and higher level about a particular subject. But the rational form of delivery of this knowledge, particularly the classic example of chalk and talk, is disenchanting to students, especially if it does not have a clear and immediate application to their day-to-day -day lives. As such, it is very difficult for them to remember, never mind apply and engage with some of this content. Now, many learners do have a variety of interests and levels of engagement on a cognitive level. They have acquired skills of engaging with material in a classroom environment through their prior study before entering higher education. But we have different and a variety of views with respect to what constitutes a good learning experience. So play offers one way of countering the disenchantment with the rational delivery of teaching. But I would argue that play is not only about engaging students with a more interesting or varied or seductive experience. It also, if we pay attention to theories of play, has always been a crucial part of how we develop new forms of knowledge. I would also suggest that if we look in more depth at play theorists, we can understand and embrace play more effectively when we are looking at ways to integrate it with classroom activities. So first, I'm going to cover some notable play theorists. One of the most well-known play theorists is Johann Huizinga. Huizinga identifies play as being a distinct activity with particular characteristics and goes on to argue that play has a foundational element in the culture of all societies. His definition that he gives on page 28 says, play is a voluntary activity 
or occupation executed within certain fixed limits of time and place, according to rules freely accepted but absolutely binding, having its aim in itself and accompanied by a feeling of tension, joy and the consciousness that it is different from ordinary life. Now, Huizenga strongly uh, emphasises the disinterestedness of play as well as its separation from ordinary activity. Now, this is crucial when we think about the application of play or games in higher education, because when we're talking about play in education, we're not talking about play as a voluntary and disinterested activity. Our next theorist is Roger Kalwa. Kalwa, writing much later than Huizenga, identifies very distinct uh, rubrics between four different categories of game play. These categories encompass play as competition, play as chance or gambling, play as simulation, or play as an attempt to experience vertigo. And within each category, he argues there is a continuum between two extremes, the extremes of ludus versus paideia. While paideia is anarchic and capricious play, a sort of carefree or uncontrolled type of play, at the alternate pole of ludus, there is a sort of binding of play using arbitrary and imperative rules or conventions it's starting to sound a bit like higher education, isn't it? So let's go back and think again. What is it that distinguishes play from learning? For both Huizenga and Kilwa, play was something that was unproductive. It was disinterested. It had no particular object. But instead, we're talking about mobilising play towards the gain of particular skills or a specific classroom experience. And so this is what is sometimes termed serious play. Play that diverges from Huizenga's core concept because it begins to challenge that particular criteria of being free and disinterested voluntary activity. Existing approaches to education and play primarily focus on children's education and much of the research in this area is funded by the LEGO Foundation. So approaches such as the LEGO Serious Play principles share a lot in common with other approaches including game-like learning, playwork and pedagogy of play. One of the notable principles that is shared in all these approaches is an attempt to make learning fair and to make participation egalitarian. This embraces turn-taking as a gameplay mechanic and tries to utilise this in the classroom. In terms of learning theories, these tend to focus on Piaget's notion of developmental learning or draw on the idea of experiential learning. I'll come back to this point later. One final significant theorist is Brian Sutton Smith, who published The Ambiguity of Play in the 1990s. Sutton Smith's work has recently been used by Professor Alison James to interpret why we think of play in education in particular ways. According to Sutton Smith, we interpret both what play is and what it should be for according to seven distinct discourses, some of which were more common in ancient civilizations, while others are distinctly modern. So we might interpret play as a way of divining fate, as a means of solidifying or celebrating community identity, as an exercise of cultural power, or simply as the expression of frivolity. Much of the contemporary research into play and developmental psychology conceives of play is part of a narrative of progress. Play may also be interpreted as the expression of and development of imagination or of the self as a matter of personal individual identity.
All of these discourses have relevance in higher education, but perhaps most significantly that of progress. Gamification is defined by Detterding as the application of game design elements to non-game settings or experiences. Now often these game design elements are something that we would refer to in game design as mechanics or dynamics. Different mechanics offer players ways of interacting or acting inside a game and they're often visualised using a range of components including images, icons and little board pieces such as you can see here. There may be multiple boards and to help the player there are sometimes specific pieces to help them keep track. But perhaps you're expecting something a bit more like snakes and ladders. So, so that we can understand a little bit more about what I'm talking about when I talk about game mechanics, the next section of this presentation is going to highlight some common game design elements. Luck or gambling, as we find in dice games, is common, as is turn-taking in games like cards. We find a variety of components involved in different games, in complex game boards that require turn-taking and extensive scoring and calculation of point system. You may wish to look at some experiences or examples of games or activities that you would use in the classroom and see if these game design elements are present in your activity. I've summarised here some of the most common mechanics or rules which you'll find are common in the classroom even when you're not expressly playing a game. So sequenced activity such as using turns, drawing cards or playing something or submitting some information is something that is a foundation of many different games. A repetition of that activity, for example, through different rounds or different levels is something that we also find as being foundational even in simple games. And game designers talk about how we expand on that to develop a game through a loop that is often structured by expansion, action on the player's part, and then some sort of reward or feedback for completing that action. This cycle is very similar to what we might do in assessing student work in the classroom and giving them some sort of feedback on their performance. It's also similar to what we do in formalised assessments. Now, these mechanics or rules come together to develop into strategies or dynamics. Many games you will already be familiar with are generally formulated as abstract strategy games using a combination of memory and decision making and knowledge of the rules to identify a way to play the game to best effect. Other common games develop not only skill and chance but also rules about bluffing that are both explicit and implicit in the rules of the game. Combined with these, we find many contemporary game design elements include resource management, logic, trading of different commodities, placement of certain um, workers um, or um, entities within the game which develop game resources, as well as the use of storytelling or simulation dynamics to imitate something that goes on in real life. The combination of dynamics and aesthetics often connect in a theme of a game to provide a particular context, narrative or story, and using things like physical game pieces and the play environment to connect with the players in a way that is important to the design of the game. Most digital educational interventions that try to gamify the classroom environment aim to give students an opportunity to act in a classroom environment that is often dominated by a speaker. In this ad for Mentimeter, they highlight 
that the speaker is disempowered by not knowing the perceptions or attitudes of the people listening to their presentation. They promote their interactive app as a means to redress this. In the classroom, we've used all kinds of gamification as an augmentation for some time. Things like storytelling and role-playing have been very common aspects of classroom teaching for many years. However, what is not so clear, unless you look at this through a game design lens, is the way in which these actions often still maintain the teacher as an authority or in power in the situation. It is less common to empower learners to take direct action in response to their learning. So how can we connect the understanding, the theoretical understanding of play with our understanding and knowledge when it comes to different approaches to learning and pedagogy? So first of all, we can look at these kind of content and function definitions of what play is. And there are some uh, references to play in early educational texts. We could look at definitions that might be derived from the work of Piaget, Vygotsky or Dewey. Each has something either directly or indirectly to contribute to our understanding of play and learning. For Piaget, play is simply an early stage in the process of cognitive development. By contrast, if we take a Vygotsky-based approach, Play can be construed as a constructed or model experience, something that people can enter into uh, as a, a sort of temporary, uh, separate uh, environment from everyday life in order to develop or construct an alternative model of understanding. Similarly, Dewey talks about play um, in some of his writings on education um, in a way that interprets play in terms of a sort of psychological attitude. Though Dewey talks more about the playfulness of the instructor and the inherent playfulness of things like conversation as a medium for learning. This takes more of an aesthetic approach than either Piaget or Vygotsky, but equally shares many features with some of the thinking on play that we mentioned earlier on in the workshop. Returning to this formal definition of play in a learning context from Larson, we can see features that similarly imitate Huizinga's definition of play particularly in reference to the distinct play space that is set apart from uh, everyday normal life, something that Larson talks of as a unified situational activity. Such an activity might describe a lecture or a seminar conversation, though it is less likely to represent something in which people are fully engaged. So how does this practically apply in a classroom or learning development environment? I would argue that we actually use play a lot more frequently than we'd like to admit, but it's something that we find more often that is engaged with by teachers than by students. Um, it, there is a tradition in controlling the classroom which allows uh, those who are in an empowered position, teachers, instructors, and so on, to engage in playful acts, often as a form of demonstration, or inviting students to engage in playful acts in order to um, consolidate their learning. So, depending on your particular theoretical approach, whether you see play as something that enables a social dynamic in the classroom, or whether you um, appreciate playfulness as an aesthetic that is crucial to knowledge development and learning more broadly, there are a number of specific ambitions of play in higher education that tend to align with these different theoretical approaches. The first of these, and perhaps one of the most significant, is the use of play and games to enhance student autonomy.
This allows uh, games or play to provide the learner with alternative routes to knowledge rather than the enforced method of uh, knowledge transfer that has been assumed in many traditional conversational or um, observational demonstrations in a classroom. There is also the possibility that by using games and play to engage students in peer learning, games and play have a great potential to activate double loop learning and enhance students' development of particular skills as well as knowledge relevant to their subject. From this perspective, play offers a great opportunity to reflect on and perhaps revise our existing roles and behaviours, either by giving us critical distance from the subject we're studying, or in the same mode, allowing us to reflect on our own learning processes. A further ambition of play in higher education can be for games in the classroom or more broadly to contribute towards critical pedagogies. When we acknowledge that education exists inside social relations of power and inequality, we can also see the ways in which games and play in the classroom can be used to empower students and do things such as expose the hidden curriculum, democratise student-teacher relationships and facilitate student solidarity. But while these uh, ambitions of play in higher education may be laudable, it is important that we remember the educational experience is something the power relationships of which we generally understand as practitioners in a HE environment. By contrast, it's important that we should remember the experience that a player of a game or a simulation learns from is not a natural experience such as work experience or general life experience in the world encountering organisations, but it is a designed experience that has been influenced by the intentions and development of the game designer. When we look at the way in which game designers go about intentionally developing such um, interventions or experiences, they are not separate from their own political and sociological context. And indeed, a variety of games are directly developed as a means of critiquing or challenging those dominant relationships. The example shown here, Suffragetto, was in fact sold by the Women's Social and Political Union to raise funds and build awareness around the issues of women getting the vote in the United Kingdom over 100 years ago. But games do not only exist to provide social critique. Many contemporary games are produced in circumstances which encourage them to do the very opposite and may reinforce relations of inequality. Such relations may be reproduced through an unintentional or intentional embedding in the game's very mechanics. McGonagall in 2011 argued that games have four features. A sense of purpose, rules, feedback systems and voluntary participation. Now, in a commercial environment, getting the balance between that sense of purpose, the rules, the feedback, the voluntary participation is crucial to maintain engagement. And perhaps the most popular ambition of bringing play into higher education is to enhance the engagement of students with classroom activities or broadly with learning activities on their programme. By using games, there is an attempt to improve the attractiveness of learning experiences. Alternatively, there is also an attempt to um, focus on a behaviourist understanding of the learner and basically make learning a more enjoyable experience 
so that uh, students will be more willing to dedicate the time and energy to get themselves into an ideal learning um, sort of attitude. Uh, such as uh, drawing on Vygotsky, the idea of the zone of proximal development. So the focus of an engagement approach to integrating play or games in learning is to consider the student experience of learning as the foremost concern. From a game design point of view, this involves ensuring that the sense of purpose the development of skills in order to produce a feeling of competence and mastery and the continued um, freely chosen engagement in the activity is prioritised through the way in which the actions of the player are facilitated. And this can include the full range of gamification style interventions, such as comparing players against each other using competitive modes, leaderboards, badging, and all of those features I discussed earlier. Now, we could say this is very similar to the way in which we um, program learning and assessment opportunities in higher education. We ask students to attend classroom sessions that we outline as having specific learning objectives and that are broadly linked to a sense of purpose that is connected with the programme objectives of their degree. There are specific rules of behaviour, of collecting information, of what information is considered valid or invalid in a classroom environment or an assessment setting. And these rules are often carefully documented in terms of university procedures and in terms of things like module handbooks. We have feedback systems that we use with students to give them an idea of how they're doing. I will say, however, on this point of feedback, that it's useful to highlight how games often give students or players very, very swift feedback on how they are progressing, especially computerised or automated games. These give students an immediate idea of how well they are progressing towards the game's objectives. Often in higher education, our feedback systems are aligned with the release of marks and the assessment of students in an annual, biannual or relatively infrequent schedule this is similar to the challenge of scoring up at the end of any game session in board games and other types of strategy game. Considering these similarities, I propose that if you are looking to embrace play through the medium of games in education, it's worth us considering a move away from intended learning outcomes towards a close examination of intended gaming outcomes. If we understand the usual approach of designing learning around intended learning outcomes as being focused on the product of the sequence of learning, intended gaming outcomes focus instead on the process and what is um, developed through that process. So we might think about whether or not a particular game or learning activity promotes student autonomy. When we look at a range of different games, the autonomy of the player is always something that's in tension. There are specified actions that are allowed, but there are other types of action that in digital games particularly are simply not permitted by the interface. And this dynamic or tension in the autonomy of the player is something that it is in the designer's uh, aim to manage. Equally, a designer needs to manage the challenge that the player encounters in order to ensure that they continue to develop their skill, expand their knowledge or engage in competition with others in order to continue participating in the game. Now, equally, we might think of the challenge that our students face in order to continue engaging with their studies. Now, when looking at game design and considering the 
focus on coherence. This is usually to do with whether the narrative of the game and the progression of the player through the game is coherent with the types of activities the game is asking them to perform. So, for example, a game that is themed around the production of food in a restaurant environment will need to make sure that all of the player actions are appropriately timed and linked to that overall purpose or objective. It would perhaps be valuable for us to draw on this notion of coherence in order to use games to build contextual awareness in students in the classroom, or perhaps to link their activities in the classroom with broader um, social, political, um, economic news and developments in the real world. Finally, one of the significant intended gaming outcomes that we might want to focus on is the development of competence and mastery, or the feeling of ability to progress to that stage. This is important if we think about how challenging students find it when they, uh, when they are faced with failure through particular learning assessments or classroom environments. The focus on uh, iterative progression and a repeated loop in game design is something that we can adapt into our classroom teaching. A final theme that I have been working on is the uh, design feature of the game aesthetic, um, or in some respects, the game ethic. Whether a game facilitates students' interactions in a competitive or collaborative frame, whether they simply embrace the game as a means to achieve points, a sort of play to win approach to the game, or whether we can develop students' skills and abilities more broadly by inculcating an um, association of the game with learning um, to sort of develop their curiosity and love of learning in the subject. In order to do so, it is very beneficial to focus on the ways in which particular learning activities promote competition or collaboration between students and whether they allow for relatively safe ways to fail and try again. In this, one thing that has come out of my own research and reading in uh, game studies is the significance of debriefing and reflective learning activities around games. But we had better counter the idealistic perspective on the application of play and games to a learning environment. Here are some warnings. It's worth recognising that there is a dark side to introducing play in the classroom, which is that it can be used to continue to reinforce student-teacher power dynamics and infantilise the learner. This is also an issue between the academic and the institution. So where there is mixed support for play practices or gamified practices by the institution, this can be a result of the perception of play as frivolity, as non-serious and non-conducive to um, achieving learning outcomes. And so from the point of view of enabling play at an instructor level, this is sometimes another challenge that can be faced in higher education. A particular challenge that we can identify from the literature on studies of gamification in work is also the challenge of exploitation. Games have the potential to be too successful. They can draw people into participating and they have the same risk of addiction as gambling. So this can be used to enhance student engagement, certainly. However, it can also encourage students to direct their attention inappropriately in excessive degrees. And so there is the possibility that students will in fact act in ways that are not in their best interests as a result of the introduction of games to higher education. <laughs>
And this links to uh, something that is useful to know from game studies in relation to the different uh, motivations of game players. So Fox et al. in 2018, publishing on entrepreneurship and often the use of simulation, have said that actually good educational games should not be too good as games. Because game design, successful game design, distracts from the learning outcomes of the activity. And this particular um, desire of players to play for distraction or to play as a way of escaping from the demands of day-to-day -day life, of work, of other difficult challenges, can be um, misapplied if not carefully thought about in relation to your learning outcomes because it can engage learners into an attitude in which their intentions are solely aimed at leisure and they will not take away the intended learning outcomes. Alison James in her recent report on education and play um, in UK higher education um, has highlighted these as gargoyles, challenges that are broadly indicative across higher education and something that we need to identify and be aware of in order to address. She doesn't have any silver bullet solutions, but she does suggest that we need to consider the appropriateness of play and games without being um, evangelists about their potential. And so despite my enthusiasm for play and games, we've reached the end of this recording. Thank you for watching, and if you do have thoughts or comments on any of the themes that have come up in this recording, please do get in touch.